Okay, so it is an absolute honor. It is a, truly an honor to have you on our show, Congressman Raskin. And thank you so much for giving me an hour of your valuable time. And because the time goes so quickly, we're just gonna jump right into it. So the first thing that I wanna sort of bring up is the fact that yesterday, a New York Times article that was written by Michael Bender and Michael Gold entitled, Trump's dire words raise new fears about his authoritarian bent. I don't know if you've had a chance to see it, but it is an absolutely terrifying article on something that I have talked about for years now. And that is that Donald Trump wants to be an authoritarian that, and I'm going to give you a quick quote from the article itself. Um, he turns around and it says, Mr. Trump's allies dismiss, of course, the concerns of as alarmism and cynical political attacks. But what he intends to do is these ambitions include using the Justice Department to take vengeance on his political rivals, plotting a vast expansion of presidential power and installing ideologically aligned lawyers in key positions to bless his contentious actions. Now, you and I have talked about this at length on and off. And first of all, the most important thing I do want to say to you is, as we like to say in the Jewish religion, refuah shlema, you know, meaning health, continued health, and more health. Michael, it's a it's a real pleasure to be with you, man. And um, thank you for everything you've been doing. And thank you for having me on the show. I've been looking forward to it. Um, and thank you for your kind words. I just had my six month checkup after um, the chemo ended and uh, everything looks good. They couldn't thank find God. any cancer cells. So I'm hanging tough. Um, meantime, uh, the body politic is still suffering um, with uh, Donald Trump uh, at large and him having consolidated his power and control over the Republican Party, um, which is now operating like an authoritarian party. You know, the political scientists tell us an authoritarian party is one which does not accept the results of elections that don't go their way. They refuse to disavow or they openly embrace political violence as a means for um, achieving power. And they violate at every turn and express their intention to violate at every turn the constitutional order. So this is what we've got, uh, as well as um, you know, a charismatic leader that, that in the sociological sense, not in the political sense, but yes, a charismatic leader who um, is able to control not just his party, but large masses of people through his words. So it is a terrifying situation. He has made it clear that he wants the Constitution set aside. He said that uh, repeatedly. And their absolute intention is to weaponize the government and everything they talk about with respect to law enforcement, weaponizing the government is just uh, a projection and an inversion rhetorically to try to confuse people about what's going on. I mean, we've never had a, a president who has attempted to completely convert the government into an instrument of his personal will. And that's what we've got with uh, Donald Trump. And I saw another article uh, akin to the one you're describing, Michael, um, I think it was in the Times um, about, uh, or maybe it was in the Post, about how many of Donald Trump's former confidants and intimates and close associates, such as yourself, um, are blowing the whistle from the rooftops, telling people, um, if he comes back, we're moving into a very different kind of government, at least something like you see in Putin's Russia, and perhaps even worse. He is talking about creating concentration camps for uh, undocumented people, rounding them up, putting them into camps and deporting millions of people. So that might give people a glimpse of what he's got in mind. Yeah, he's got more than that in mind. And both you and I are on that list. I can assure you, I can assure you of that one. But the article you're referring to uh, is the one that dealt with Cassidy Hutchinson when she said, by the way, it's not that she's saying anything new or unique, and I'm thankful that she has finally come forward. Would have been nice if she would have come forward a little earlier, right? But um, she's been saying or parroting what I've been saying 
what you've been saying for an awfully long time. In fact, Congressman, I actually called on you uh, and asked you as a favor, I do intend on putting through pardon application. And one of the things that we talked about, which is, I suspect, why you agreed to even produce the letter for me. And if I can, I'll just quote one fast line. Mr. Cohen has done good time for his offenses, endured outrageous and unlawful retaliatory punishment in the form of more than two weeks in solitary confinement in prison for refusing to surrender his First Amendment rights. I mean, that is exactly what Donald Trump intends to do. He intends to rewrite the Constitution on day number one. He intends to destroy our tripartite system of government, confer all power to the executive branch, namely himself. He's going to, at that point in time, he won't even need Congress. He won't need um, the, the judiciary. If you're not on his side, if you're not a Jim Bag Jordan, if you're not a Marjorie Toilet Green or any of the other sycophantic members of the, of the Congress, well, he'll just round you up, jail you, and throw you somewhere, very much like what Stalin used to do. There is no need for or what Kim Jong-un would do or what Mohammed bin Salman or Putin does, like, for example, to Navalny and others. This is exactly what he wants to do. And I'll tell you, you know who really needs to worry as much as you and I are the uber, uber wealthy, the Elon Musks, the Zuckerbergs, right? Uh, you know, all of these, you know, billionaires, because the first thing he's going to do is parrot what Mohammed bin Salman did. He's going to round them up. He's going to put them on little cots in mar a in the in the ballroom. And he's going to have them sign over their vast wealth to him because he never wanted to be president of the United States. He always looked at this as it was supposed to be the greatest infomercial in the history of U.S. politics. Now he's already tasted what the power is. He knows what he's done. He certainly tried it with me. And thank God for Alvin K. Hellerstein and my attorney, Donya Perry, for having me released. But look at also January 6th. These are practice runs for him. He now knows what he can and he can't do. And my real fear is on day number one, right after he gets sworn in, he tries to change the Constitution and anybody that's going to go against him is going to feel his wrath. But I agree with everything you just said, except I don't know that he's going to change the Constitution. He's not going to try to amend the Constitution with a two thirds vote in the House and the Senate and three quarters of the states, because we would absolutely be able to stop him there. Um, he will just avoid and trample the Constitution, as he did in your case. I mean, you know, what, what he did to Michael Cohen was to have you thrown into solitary confinement for a two week period um, in an utterly lawless manner until finally your lawyers were able to get a federal district court judge to um, to get you released. Um, but this is, uh, you know, his methodology. I mean, he almost overthrew the presidential election of 2020 um, through multiple different offensives, first in the state legislatures, then with state election officials like Brad Raffensperger, he pressed at all of these different pressure points to see if he could make it happen. And finally, when too many people stood up against him, then it was, we are going to get Vice President Pence, uh, who was the sycophant of sycophants for four years, to step outside of his constitutional role and just unilaterally decree that Trump would be the president again. And on that day, Mike Pence earned his salary and said he wouldn't do it. In the meantime, he unleashed a violent insurrection against us by saying, you got to fight and you got to fight like hell. And if you don't, you won't have a country anymore. And we're going down to the Capitol and on and on and on. Everybody saw exactly what happened. Nothing in American history compares to what he did to us on that day. So he will push it as far as he can go. So what we're looking for is the mass majority of Americans who reject authoritarianism, who reject totalitarianism, who reject his intended alliance with every tyrant and despot and 
uh, kleptocrat and autocrat on earth right. to stand up in this election and then to vote to stop them that way, to defend the election results against the inevitable, which is they will uh, claim it's been stolen. And then, um, you know, who knows what hell he intends to unleash against the American Republic. So it is not too early to be talking about this. And I'm thrilled that you're um, out there campaigning for our democracy, which is also campaigning for our freedom. Could you imagine it's not just whether he wins, he's going to unleash hell on America. It's if he loses. So it's a no win situation. The only way to win as America and for our democracy is if somehow or another he's not even permitted to be on the ballot. But then again, he'll then try to unleash some other type of hell. I mean, he has really put into his mind that he could be the Vladimir Putin of the United States of America, that he could be the Kim Jong-un of America, that he could be the, you know, um, the, <laughs> I mean, the, the Mussolini. Mussolini. The Mussolini. Yeah. I mean, it's that's why I call him the Mandarin Mussolini. This is exactly what he wants to do. And I'll tell you, He's not going to, if in fact, God forbid, a million times he wins the election, he's not going to look to amend the Constitution in the traditional way. You, as a constitutionalist, as a lawyer and a scholar, understand there is a process that everybody else in the world, that every other American prior to him and, so, God willing, after him would follow the way our founding fathers established it, but not him. He's going to just shred it from day one, say with executive privilege, he has the right to do this. And if you want, take it to the, sue me. Let's take it to the Supreme Court. And he'll take control over the DOJ. He'll put in somebody a whole lot worse than Bill Barr. And that's a fucking very low bar, by the way, right? Um, I mean, a really low bar. I'm actually almost a little bit shocked. How come Congress hasn't called Bill Barr in and asked him what role that he played? Because you, Dan Goldman, Congressman Steve Cohen, um, Hakeem Jeffries, Ted Lieu, Senator Dick Durbin, all have tried to get documents in regard to the unconstitutional remand against me. But so far, nobody has come in. Nobody has held any accountability. I cannot. It's now 19 months that the court has told FOIA to go out and to provide at least 500 or to process 500 documents a month, not a single document has been received to date. How come there's no how come there's no hearings on this? Well, of course, um, we're not in control of the House, um, but I am the ranking Democrat on the Oversight Committee and fully intend for the Democrats to take the House back, even against the wall of gerrymandered districts that we're up against in so many states. Um, and when that happens, we are going to pursue justice across the board. And that means defending people against Donald Trump. I mean, you made a really important point, Michael, which is fundamentally, this is a money-making operation. Um, when Donald Trump got into this, uh, it was with the kleptocratic ambition of making millions, hundreds of millions and billions of dollars. I mean, we saw um, uh, Jared Kushner, um, bring back a cool $2 billion for a corporation he created the day after uh, the Trump administration ended uh, from Saudi Arabia. Um, and we've already documented millions of dollars in unconstitutional foreign emoluments that went from governments like Saudi Arabia, like China, like Turkey, like the United Arab uh, Emirates, right into the various Trump enterprises, the uh, hotels, the Trump Tower, um, the golf courses, um, and so on. You know, Donald Trump uh, started his administration saying that he wasn't going to accept his presidential salary because this wasn't about him. That's the only thing he's allowed to accept. Mm -hmm. He should have kept the salary, and he was not allowed to take the tens of millions of dollars that were pouring in from foreign governments um, in thinly disguised bribes to the administration. And it, it doesn't end now. We know um, uh, at least 
uh, a significant part of what Saudi Arabia got out of this arrangement. It was the very first destination for the president to fly to. Uh, this theocratic, autocratic tyranny, um, which uh, oppresses religious minorities, women, you name it, uh, a fomenter of anti-Semitic propaganda all over the world through the madrasa schools. Um, and yet they went there first. They covered up the assassination, dismemberment, drawing and quartering of uh, journalist Adnan Khashoggi. No, Jamal um, Khashoggi. Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, yeah, Jamal, not Adnan, Jamal Khashoggi. That was his uncle. Um, and they, um, you know, th at, at every turn, they uh, they tilted strongly towards the Saudi tyranny um, and uh, Mohammed bin Salman. So um, it's a money making operation and he intends to go back in and to continue that. But um, he clearly believes and understands that to get away with all of these crimes, he's going to have to stifle and squelch the opposition completely. And that, of course, is where fascism comes from. And that is um, a, a pretty good diagram of what fascism looks like. All of the money going to the leader and the the clique uh, around him, uh, his family, his private corporations, um, and then law and order and punishment for anybody who objects to uh, the destruction of constitutional and democratic norms. Yeah, he's not looking for millions, and he's certainly not even looking for billions. He is looking for trillions. He wants to be the richest man in the entire world because he believes himself to be a deity. Now, you know, I read something, and I don't know it to be true. I've been trying to fact check it. But there's rumors that Jared Kushner, through this $2 billion, and I don't think the $2 billion had only to do with Donald arriving in Saudi first. I think it had to do also with the military uh, equipment that was sold uh, to Mohammed bin Salman. It was probably sold at a discount, so both sides feel like they got a negotiated deal. But I, I read somewhere that Kushner, through the $2 billion that had come into the fund, invested into Univision or into one of their entities and that's one of the reasons why Univision has now elected. And again, I don't have that to be factual, but it certainly sounds like the Trump playbook that I would know. You know, you can't control. Let, let me be clear about something. During the 2015 announcement after Trump completely um, made an ass of himself with his Mexico and Mexican comments, Univision pulled away. And they didn't want to be members anymore of the Doral, which abuts the back of the uh, property. They refused to do any functions and events there. They canceled, and it's like $10 million a year in terms of business. All of a sudden, there's a little new regime there now. J uh, Jared Kushner's got $2 billion. And all of a sudden, they're now saying that Biden can't or sue any PACs that have to do with benefiting Biden cannot be run on that. I don't understand why the FCC doesn't pull their license. Well, <clears throat> you're making a great point, which is, you know, a right wing authoritarian government like this is not just an assault on democracy and the Constitution. It's also an assault on the free market. I mean, the market is free as long as your corporation, your business goes along with exactly what uh, El Jefe is telling you to do. <laughs> um, if you cross Donald Trump, he will try to use the government to crush you. Um, and I know that all too well, my friend. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, you know, he's willing to do it to large corporations, not just, um, you know, New York lawyers who used to work for him. Um, you, you know, you're either going to be in his pocket and he's going to tell you what to do to enhance his power or you're an enemy and he is out to destroy you. I mean, that is the fascist worldview. It's just um, friends and sycophants and then enemies. Yeah. And you choose, you know, are you going to do everything that he says uh, and get out of his way? Or uh, is he going to have to destroy you? And that is his view of the world. And, you know, it, you know this better than I do or pretty much anybody. I mean, that's not just a political philosophy. I mean, that's a psychological condition for him. Um. You know, it's like judges. A, a judge, he doesn't believe in uh, the idea of any objectivity or neutrality in law. 
So a judge is either in his pocket, he controls them, um, like the judge in Florida, uh, who's on one of his cases, um, or uh, the judge is a sworn enemy um, and an evil Democrat and vermin and so on. Yeah. So let me move on and ask you this, because on Monday, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals moved to drastically weaken the Voting Rights Act by barring private citizens and civil rights groups from filing lawsuits. I mean, how much of a setback for voters' rights is this really? And do you expect that it'll end up in front of the Supreme Court? Well, it will with a predictable outcome. Um, look, the, the Supreme Court already dismantled uh, the central mechanism of the Voting Rights Act, which is the preclearance mechanism in Section 5. And that was in the Shelby County versus Holder case, where the Supreme Court said that the coverage formula was out of date and therefore unconstitutional. Therefore, it was going to essentially usurp con Congress's power to enforce the 14th Amendment and uh, rip the Voting Rights Act to shreds. All that was left was this Section 2 provision that would at least allow people to sue after the fact. The preclearance mechanism was gone because of what the court did, but it would at least allow people to sue after the fact and, you know, get the case heard. Well, now um, the right wing taking up on hints dropped by Justice Gorsuch has decided to go after that. And you can uh, you can imagine with me what's going to happen when it gets up to the totally gerrymandered Supreme Court. Uh, and, um, you know, th that kind of uh, racial reaction is a critical part of the policy offensive of the Trump movement and the GOP, which has, alas, embraced it now. I mean, the Republican Party was Lincoln's party. It used to be a pro-freedom, anti-slavery, pro-immigration, anti-know-nothing, progressive party in the American political context. And today, um, there are no enemies on the right at all to speak of. And anytime there's a showdown between democracy and fascism, uh, they see very fine people on both sides. And increasingly, they just see fine people on the side of authoritarianism. <laughs> it's, uh, it's so scary. You know, I'm going through this something a little bit similar uh, with the Bivens case that was overturned. Um, December 14th, I'm actually um, going to the appellate court uh, here. Um, we believe, and I'm 100% certain, that our argument uh, should win the day, um, especially considering it is of what was done to me in terms of making me the first political prisoner held in this country. Um, you know, it's the most unusual of circumstance. But I want to move on because I, I sit and I listen to this Freedom Caucus and I'm so confused by them because seemingly more and more Republicans on the Hill are going completely off the rails, devolving into this verbal and physical attacks. And not just, of course, against Democrats, but on one another. And as a result... The House isn't getting much done in the meantime, not at least for the American people. So what can Democrats in the minority get done when the majority has seemingly lost its collective mind? Well, we're, we're trying to work very closely with um, the Senate, where there is a, a narrow Democratic majority, and with the White House to keep moving things forward. I mean, um, it, it's amazing that in the face of of all of the chaos and the dysfunction and incompetence unleashed by the Republicans, that we were able to pass the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. Um, you know, I sat there for four years under Donald Trump. We had an infrastructure week. We had an infrastructure month. We had infrastructure press conferences. We just never had an infrastructure bill. Uh, they never got it done. Uh, and Biden came in in a, in a second month, I think, um, we brought that out, got it to the floor, and we passed it, a $1.2 trillion investment in the bridges and the roads and the highways and the ports and the airports and rail and trail and uh, high-speed internet access through broadband. We did that, and we did the same thing with the Chips and Science Act, and we did the same thing with the Inflation Reduction Act, which is a record investment in 
wind and solar and alternative energies to break the control of uh, the carbon barons over our economy and over our future because um, the climate has been destabilized and it's a danger for everybody. But also in the, the Inflation Reduction Act, we dramatically lowered um, prescription drug costs in the Medicare program. I mean, I had constituents who were paying over $1,000 a month um, in order to uh, get their insulin shots as diabetics. And now we capped it at $35 a month. Um, we did that without a single Republican vote. So we're, we're able to try to keep pushing for progress, but it's gotten harder and harder. We have a lot of people leaving Congress, as you know, Michael. I mean, very good members, John Sarbanes from Maryland, Earl Blumenauer mm -hmm. uh, from Oregon, um, Dan now, Kilby. Now, now Joe Manchin's leaving. Yeah, I mean, dozens and dozens of people are saying that they can't take it anymore. And of course, that's all part of the process. I mean, you know, I, I've got uh, a, um, a a friend who is from Kansas, Sharice Davids, who actually was uh, a fighter before she came to Congress. She did, um, you know, mixed martial arts and all that kind of stuff. And she said, I left that in order to come here to legislate. And now I'm watching people who are supposed to be legislating, fighting, and they can't do either. They mm. can't legislate and they can't fight. Yeah. Look, it's, you know, I know that this sounds crazy and I, um, I'm actually contemplating on running in the primary against Jerry Nadler. You know, I just, I feel that like this young lady, that you need somebody who's willing to fight, willing to put their ass on the line for the country and not just sit back and, you know, like you fight all the time when you were as healthy as a, you know, as a bull, when you weren't as healthy, you know, and now thank God again, you know, healthy. You're the, you're a fighter. Dan Goldman is, is a fighter. I'm watching this kid Moskowitz, who's a fighter. You know, they're not afraid to say what the rest of us are all thinking. And then you have a whole group that they just like, like oh my God, let me put my head into the sand and God willing, when I pull it out of the sand, Everything is going to be back to normal. We're not going back to normal. Not, not for a long, long time. Not while this ideology of Trumpism still exists. Because as I finish my book, Revenge, Trumpism is fascism. And we need to eradicate it from our body politic. Plain and simple. Um, you know, and we need to defend the rule of law and the constitution. And that's, you know, that is ultimately how we are going to defeat Donald Trump. I mean, he's a one man crime wave. Um, and in the judiciary committee, you know, under chairman Nadler, so many of those crimes have been exposed and have been, uh, have been surfaced. Um, so I did not think, I did not know that you were running for Congress. I, or you're thinking about running for Congress. Um, of course, Jerry Nadler just uh, defeated Carolyn Maloney when their districts were you yeah know, gerrymandered. Uh, she's a nice, she's a nice lady well, too. Yeah. yeah. So but, then, um, can I ask you this, Congressman? Yeah, so please. respectfully, then, why didn't you, why'd you stay in the House and not run for the Senate? Well, of course, I was you know I was fighting cancer um, and going through chemotherapy um, when all of that kind of uh -huh. came to a head and. Um, so I certainly saw it through the prism of um, the precariousness and the, the fragility of life, you know. And um, I look, the, the, the bottom line for me was that um, I'm the ranking Democrat on the Oversight Committee. If, if we win, uh, I'll be chairman of the Oversight Committee. I don't know exactly what Congressman Nadler's plans are in terms of his future and how much longer he'll be in, whether it's this term or one more term or two more terms. I don't know, but it's possible that, you know, that's something that could be in my future, the Judiciary Committee too. And um, I just thought we are in the fight of our lives with these people. I feel about it exactly the way you do, Michael. Um, you know, it's an existential moment for America's experiment in constitutional democracy and freedom. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to spend the next year traveling around Maryland fighting Democrats. I'm out raising mm. money, millions of dollars. I hope certainly more than a million already, but I hope millions of dollars. 
for Democrats in key races around the country. And I feel like it's my assignment to do that. So I wouldn't write it off for the future, but I think I'm exactly where I need to be right now. Okay. Listen, that's, <laughs> you know, you know, your life, you know, better than anybody else. And, you know, um, obviously I, I see you as even higher than that, you know, one of these days, because legitimately few people I've seen come out and fight with the intelligence and the fervor that you do, which kind of brings me to the point of MAGA Mike Johnson. I mean, he's thus far been like this mixed bag as a Speaker of the House. He worked with Democrats to stall the debt crisis, but turned around and then released 44,000 hours of hand-picked January 6th footage. What's your take on MAGA Mike as speaker? Well, he got behind the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the continuing resolution because he knew that it would be a political disaster for the Republicans after all of the chaos and turmoil we've seen, then to shut the government down, which of course a lot of them wanted to do. So he depended on Democratic votes and was hoping that he was in enough of a honeymoon period that they wouldn't vacate his speakership the way they vacated Kevin McCarthy's speakership. But look, how did they end up with uh, Mike Johnson? Well, <clears throat> as you know, there were a number of other candidates before they got to him. Um, Donald Trump gave thumbs down to uh, a number of them, um, you know, including Steve Scalise, thumbs down. He was not um, interested in that. He was not interested in um, the majority whip. Um, but he was cool with Mike Johnson. Mike Johnson had been a critical player in supporting Trump's effort to overturn the 2020 presidential election and really uh, painted a constitutional gloss on what he was saying when he gathered together an amicus brief of all of these members uh, and sent out an email to all the Republicans saying, Donald Trump uh, wants you to join this uh, brief. And so that's where Mike Johnson was. You know, I always figured that this was the destination. It's such chaos and such turmoil over on the GOP side that the only thing that could hold them together would be an essentially theocratic agenda. It would have to be religion. Now, as you know, it's totally counterfeit religion. Um, and you might give us some insight. I would love to hear you reflect on this, how Donald Trump attracts religious people to him. I mean, that's an extraordinary thing. But in any event, um, that's the lowest common denominator for a party which otherwise doesn't have a program anymore. Um, it doesn't have any priorities other than what Donald Trump tells them to believe in. And so they would gather around him. So I assume that that could last to the end of this Congress, but maybe not. The Freedom Caucus is uh, utterly cannibalistic, and they try to out-extreme each other in terms of their support for what they think Donald Trump's innermost wishes are. But as crazy as this sounds, I mean, think about this. We're talking about Donald Trump, a guy who's twice impeached, four indictments, 91 criminal charges against him, you know, a sexual assaulter. I mean, on and on and on. His company found, you know, criminally, uh, you know, I should say civilly liable for fraud, et cetera. We can go on and on. And yet there's still like 70 million people that are following this authoritarian wannabe. Do they not read anything? Do we need to sort of like dumb down the New York Times article for them or even the New York Post article for them or some article for them so that they understand that if you vote, a vote for Donald Trump is a vote for the end of democracy. And I, I personally don't want to be led around. I don't want anybody telling me as they're doing already right now what you can and can't do in your bedroom. I don't want them, you know, turning around and saying who can and who can't vote. All of a sudden, you're going to have somebody knock down your door and it's going to be Trump's brown shirts pulling you out and sending you off to Guantanamo Bay. And I know that sounds hyperbolic, but I know him so well. I know what's on his mind and I know what he intends to do. He's looking to scare the piss out of everyone so that nobody, and I mean nobody, like the way Kim Jong-un runs North Korea, he wants to run 
a United States of America that way, the way that Vladimir Putin controls Russia, he wants to control America. The way that Mohammed bin Salman controls Saudi Arabia, he wants to control America the same way. So a vote for Donald is a vote for the end of democracy. Who in their right mind would, abs would, would do such a thing? Who would support somebody who's looking to destroy the greatest experiment that exists on this planet? Well, you're right. Look, the, the role of the president um, in our constitutional system is to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. We know Donald Trump has no interest in that. That's his essential job, as well as being commander in chief of the Army and Navy um, in times of actual conflict or when the militias have been called up. We know also from January the 6th um, that he had no interest in defending the republic. He only has an interest in um, taming the government and using it to his own for his own purposes. Um, <clears throat> this is what in Europe, you know, Viktor Orban or mm -hmm. Vladimir Putin are calling illiberal democracy. Um, <clears throat> The illiberal part of that means no rights, basically, no civil liberties, no civil rights. It's also hard to see where the democracy is. Um, the Republicans have lost the popular vote in eight of the last nine elections, and they thrive completely on anti-democratic mechanisms like voter suppression tactics, the gerrymandering um, <clears throat> of state and federal districts, um, the manipulation of the Electoral College, and then ultimately just an assault on our institutions, as we saw on January the 6th. So, yes, he's talking about moving into a completely different form of government. Now, we do have rival media systems. There are people who just listen to Fox News and then entities even further out to the right. And so they don't have this framing of it right? For them, it's all about the country is being invaded at the southern border. And Donald Trump is going to complete the job of getting Mexico to pay for the wall that Donald Trump uh, <laughs> never built. Um, and so that's just a different story. It's a different understanding. And that's what politics is about. I mean, I've turned my campaign and I live in a pretty safe blue district, Michael. Um, but my campaign, I've turned into a project called Democracy Summer, and we get high school and college kids. We educate them first about the actual history of the country and about what's going on in America today, about the struggle to defend democracy against the authoritarians. And then we have them go out and knock on doors and, you know, intervene in the swing districts and go to build a solid blue majority. We're not a perfect party by a long shot, but we are a pro-democracy party and we're a pro-freedom party. And we're not a party that's under the thumb of a dictator, somebody who would like to turn America into um, Putin's Russia with him as Putin. But we will all be if, in fact, that we're not successful. And what drives me somewhat crazy is so many of these issues could be resolved very quickly with the help of Merrick Garland. Now, I'm not saying Merrick Garland should be the, you know, the, the, the comparison to Bill Barr, right? I mean, because Bill Barr was just a yes man for Donald. And rest assured, the next Bill Barr will be even worse. But we have the White House. We have the president. You have the attorney general, for God's sakes. I mean, you know, if there's documents, like I truly believe my 468 or 486,000 documents regarding the unconstitutional remand of me and the, and the case in and of itself, I think it would show with through emails and conversations and text messages, there's no doubt in my mind what it would show that Trump was behind the entire thing. I mean, this is a man who does not care about the Constitution. He's never read the Constitution. He doesn't believe in the Constitution. He believes in merely himself. He believes in his gut instinct, right or wrong, it doesn't matter. If he thinks it, therefore it is, like the way that in the movie, The uh, Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, right? So it has been said, so it shall be done. That's who he thinks he is. He thinks that he's, you know, um, a deity, that he's, um, you know, 
God's child and rest assured that he's not. But Congressman, if I can ask you this, a Colorado court said last week that Trump did incite an insurrection against the union under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. You were talking about that before. But they are keeping his name on the ballot anyway. So could you explain to my listeners the subtleties of this ruling and why the 14th Amendment should apply to everyone who holds office, and that includes the president? Yes. So, I mean, it's an extraordinary ruling. It's extraordinary first because it is the first time that a court has joined the House of Representatives, the U.S. Senate, the January 6th committee um, in confirming that Donald Trump incited an insurrection or in this case participated in an insurrection against the Constitution. For weeks and weeks and weeks, he tried to get the Constitution overturned and himself installed as president, seizing the presidency against the constitutional order. So it sounds like um, the plaintiffs have won their suit, right? They've come in, they've said that <clears throat> Section 3 of the 14th Amendment does not allow you to occupy public office at the federal level or the state level if you were already in office and you swore an oath to support the Constitution and you violate it. Well, believe it or not, I mean, it's really <laughs> extraordinary. This uh, judge um, in Colorado determined, although he had a clearly incited insurrection, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment applies to everybody else in government, but not to the president. Now, it doesn't say it doesn't apply to the president, um, and it would its language would indicate that it applies to everybody, but the argument is, Everybody else, members of the House, members of the Senate, swear an oath to support the Constitution, and he swears an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution. And therefore, the language of having sworn an oath to support the Constitution um, negates the president being included in it. Now, it's just crazy because who could be a greater danger right. under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment to the stability and continuity of government other than the president of the United States, who is in a better position, as we saw on January the 6th, to, um, you know, attack the constitutional order and try to install himself as president, obviously uh, the president. So you would think if he were going to be excluded, it would not be written in visible ink. It would actually be explicit yeah. in the text of the Constitution, and it's not. So I say let's stick with the original text of the Constitution. Um, you know, she got it right um, that he participated in insurrection, but she got it wrong on the legal question of who it applies to. Now, I'll say this. The silver lining here is that because, as a matter of fact, as the trial judge, she determined that he participated in insurrection. That should be, um, if not binding, at least presumptively accepted by higher courts as they receive it. And they can rule on that uh, legal question of whether or not the president is covered like members of the House and the Senate and governors and everybody else. Well, I think that we're going to see, again, Trump testing the loyalties of federal court judges or the Supreme Court. I mean, that's just what he does. His feeling is he gave them the job they owe him. And that's what it is. You know, you never get it's like a it's like a, it's like a gangster. Right. You know, you're on the vig. You are on the vig for the rest of your life to do whatever he wants. And right now. I still don't understand why anybody would cast a vote. We've made so many arguments just so far as to why nobody should be supporting him. He should be, you know, he should be at the bottom of the barrel, not at the top of the barrel. I Again, well, I, I don't get it. That's right. Trump really supporters say, well, um, don't have the courts decide, have the people decide. It's anti-democratic. No, what's anti-democratic is to allow someone um, is to allow somebody who tried to overturn the whole Constitution and steal the presidency to come back again when it's very explicit in the Constitution that once you've taken the oath and violated the oath by engaging in insurrection, you can't come back again. That's the anti-democratic position. And we got hundreds of millions of people in the country. Why do we have to go back to that guy? 
the guy who's already proven himself to be a traitor to the Constitution. I, I don't get it. But, Congressman, you've said that 90 percent of the guns used to commit crimes in the United States can be traced to just 5 percent of firearm dealers. I was amazed when I when I saw that statistic. 90 percent of the guns used to commit crimes trace back to just 5 percent of firearm dealers. And you've created an amendment to the CJS appropriations bill that would ensure that we stop rewarding certain predatory gun dealers with federal contracts. Could you do me a favor? Can you expand on what your proposed amendment will do to stop gun violence? Yes, um, the, the federal government keeps track of those gun dealers who are um, outliers because the guns that they sell are repeatedly picked up in massacres, homicides, other forms of illegal activity. And it's a very small percentage, actually less than 3% of the gun dealers are on this list um, that they keep. And all I'm saying is that for that list, um, which, um, I think the number is there have to be 25 guns that have been traced to you in serious crimes within the last three years. And many of them have hundreds. Um, but if you're on that list, I'm saying you should not be able to do business with the federal government. A lot of the gun dealers are selling their guns to the FBI, to the Department of Justice, to the Department of Treasury, to the ATF. And so if we've got a list of the bad or rotten apple gun dealers, they should not be allowed to participate in that program. And you know, uh, more than 90% of Americans favor a universal violent criminal background check. So we have background checks everywhere. There's no gun show loophole under this proposal. There's no internet loophole in this proposal. There's no personal friend or family exception under this loophole. Everybody needs to have a background check. Um, because that works. Um, and yet today, hundreds of thousands of guns are being sold outside of the background check because the loopholes make the law, the Brady law, like Swiss cheese. And so we've got to close that loophole. We actually have a common sense convergence around what needs to be done in order to dramatically lower the fatality rate from guns. But the GOP is just in bed with the NRA and they oppose um any efforts um, to make our streets safer because they say the purpose of the Second Amendment is to allow the people to overthrow the government. And so the people have to have the same kind of arsenal the government has. That's not the meaning of the Second Amendment. And you can prove that just from the terms of the Constitution itself. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15 says, Congress has the power to call up the militias from the states in order to repel invasions and suppress insurrections. Right. The treason clause, the only place in the Constitution where a crime is defined, defines treason as levying arms against the union or adhering to the enemies thereof. The Republican guarantee clause says that Congress shall guarantee to the people of the states a Republican form of government and assist them in putting down domestic violence. And yet they say that the whole purpose of the Second Amendment is to give the people the power to overthrow the government, like on January the 6th, which is absurd. And that's written in invisible ink too. All the Second Amendment says is a well-regulated militia right. being necessary for the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. A well-regulated militia, regulated by whom? Regulated by the government, by the states and the feds. That's not the Proud Boys, it's not the Oath Keepers, it's not the Ku Klux Klan. Those are not militias under the Constitution. No, they're not. So if we could just switch topics altogether, can we talk about the Middle East for a moment? Because on CNN last uh, Sunday, you called for a humanitarian pause or ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. But you stipulated very clearly 
that it had to include the removal of the terrorist group along with the release of the hostages. Now, I saw just not too long ago that they're claiming that there is a potential deal that is now being brought to Israel in order for the release of hostages. And I don't know all the exact specifications uh, or the specifics to this uh, release deal. But do you think that pressure from the United States is having any sort of effect on what either side does? Um, but I believe so. I certainly believe that um, it's starting to have more and more of an effect on our ally, Israel. Um, and I did call for a whole series of steps that need to be taken, beginning with the release of the hostages. I mean, this is a profound humanitarian crisis to have 239 people still being held unlawfully under international humanitarian law. This is a crime against humanity. And then also, at least 11,000 people have been killed in Gaza. It might be over 12,000 people. That is a humanitarian catastrophe and, and nightmare. And we need to make sure that we get in water and food and medicine yep. and fuel and all of those things that are necessary to take care of people. Um, and so that will take a humanitarian pause, um, <clears throat> a bilateral short-term ceasefire, or a long-term ceasefire, if that's what the parties agree to, um, <clears throat> we should um, we should not write out write off the possibility of um, dismantling uh, Hamas as the terrorist controllers of Gaza through the kinds of negotiations that are taking place now. Obviously, the world doesn't know a lot about what negotiations are taking place. Mm -hmm. um, but that is a necessity. And then we got to get back to the underlying political dynamics of the situation, um, which allowed this medieval terrorist outfit to get into power there, um, which is the continuing inability to deal with this underlying political crisis. And so there needs to be negotiations towards a two state solution where there is a democratic Palestinian state that is secure and safe and the Israeli state that is secure and safe. And we've got to look towards peace in the future. And um, whatever injustices or human rights violations have taken place in the past are no excuse for terrorism. Uh, but terrorism is also no excuse for continuing injustice into the future. We need to resolve this political problem. Yeah, except there's only one problem. If you have a two-state solution, this is obviously the back and forth. And I am far from a Middle East uh, Talmud Chachem. You know, I'm no genius in this area. Uh, but obviously, Hamas, as you appropriately call it, this terrorist organization has taken over the power of Palestine and this uh, from the Palestinian Authority. I can't understand how something like that happens. Wouldn't the Palestinian Authority, wouldn't the Palestinians reject this, uh, especially considering all the money that was supposed to go into Palestine to benefit the Palestinian people? All of it was taken by this terrorist group so that they could build tunnels and buy rockets and buy ammunition and so on. That's certainly not going to be the way in order to make your people either safe or productive. And everybody should be entitled to lead and to live a productive life, not one like this. That's right. And Hamas is very unpopular with the Palestinians. Um, and I think Israel has correctly identified Hamas as an enemy, not just of the Israeli people, but of the Palestinian people. And, you know, th they are hostages under uh, Hamas terror and rule, yeah. uh, just like the hostages they're holding. And from an international law perspective, they are all civilian non-combatants who've been caught in the crossfire of this nightmare. So we've got to figure out a way uh, for there to be a meaningful um, partner moving forward on the Palestinian side to create uh, a free and safe democratic Palestine and to evict and eject the terrorists from the equation. And it should not be the object of power politics. I mean, we know for a long time, Prime Minister Netanyahu was perfectly fine to help prop up 
uh, Hamas because that was a divide and conquer strategy between Hamas and Fatah and the Palestinian Authority. And that worked in forestalling any kind of two-state solution, any meaningful progress in that direction. But it's been an absolute nightmare in terms of giving life to this terrorist hit squad, which came and wrecked um, a terrible catastrophe on the Israeli people. So, on, you know, uh, yeah, because so, you know. many believe that Netanyahu is a strong man, right? That he's an authoritarian who has weakened democracy in Israel. If Israel could eject Netanyahu now, do you think that it would be the best thing for the future of the country and also to help end the war? I mean, obviously, that's up to the the people of Israel. Um, I understand that his uh, public opinion favorability ratings have plummeted. Uh, if there were elections today, he would end up a backbencher in the Knesset. Uh, there was an historic security lapse um, leading up to uh, the terrorism um, and apparently a redeployment of forces from the south of Israel into the West Bank, where uh, Netanyahu's allies, of course, have been uh, running wild um, in order to try to expand their footprint um, in the West Bank. So I think that there are a lot of political dynamics going on within Israel now that don't favor Netanyahu. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, it's pretty self-evident that the country needs new political leadership. Yeah, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm with you on that one all the way. So look, uh, Congressman, the hour, as I said, the hour goes by very, very quick. I wish I could spend many more hours with you. But I want to finish it with this. The question of Biden's age, no matter what, is not going away. And the poll numbers aren't good. Despite the polls and despite what people are saying, especially, especially on the right, I think President Biden has done a pretty decent job. I think he's passed a lot of important bills. I think he's done a lot over the course of the past uh, almost three years being in office. Are you concerned about Biden's ability to win the next election? And assuming that he does win the election, to do the job? Well, you know, because of the stakes in this election, the magnitude of this election, as we've been discussing um, during this hour, Michael, um, people are stressed and people are very anxious and people want to make sure we're making both the absolute best case for Biden and that everything's going to work out okay. And, you know, there are no guarantees in uh, the business of politics. You want a guarantee, you know, you, you buy a, a dishwasher, but there are no guarantees here. Um, as you say, he's got a very strong record to be running on. I mean, um, yeah. an exemplary record of policy um, progress. And I think that a lot of the tension and anxiety does relate to the stakes of this election. And, um, you know, so far, I've not see any, seen anybody presenting a better plan then let's move forward with Biden. Um, no candidate is uh, is perfect, and um, we're going to be out there to help him. And it's our job, you know, not to sit back and you know be throwing uh, tomatoes and popcorn at the screen. It's our job to be involved, to register voters, to mobilize people, to get out to vote, and also let the young people know that hey. Um, Politics is a team sport. You're putting a whole team into place. You're putting in a president, a vice president, a cabinet um, to work with a Congress to get stuff done. It's not about, you know, electing your favorite action hero. Right, understood. But the DNC, they do a terrible job in messaging. Like, what would you say to Biden today in order to help to rehabilitate these numbers? Because his poll numbers are not reflective of the quality of the job that he has done. They're just not. And for whatever the reason is, he's not getting the message out there. He's losing, as we now know, Latino votes, which were very big for him in terms of winning the election in 2020. There's an increase in black Americans who are now thinking for the authoritarian, which I don't get, as well as the young Gen Zers. So 
Everything is just, I feel like I'm living in bizarro land where a guy is doing a really great job. I don't care what he looks like. I really don't. I don't care if he's, if he's 80 years old. It doesn't mean anything. He's doing a good job. And the DNC and Biden himself, he's just not getting the message out there. He's just not. Well, you know, the, whenever I travel around the country, I got to say that the single thing that I get uh, most questions about of a critical nature is messaging and how come, you know, the DNC or the White House is not doing a better job messaging all of the remarkable progress we've been able to make against the most adverse circumstances. And all I can say is, um, you know, the president is obviously buffeted on all sides by Ukraine, by Israel, by Congress, everything that's happening, and it's going to be our job to go out and tell part of that story. And if you need a message, I'll leave your your great viewers here with a, a message, Michael, which is everything that you need to know about voting is everything you need to know about driving. So tell the young people in your family at Thanksgiving, if you want to go forward, you put it in D. If you want to go backwards, you put it in R. Ah, very that's all good. you need to know. That is all you need to know. Congressman, thank you so much. Again, so glad that you were able to join me. Glad that you're feeling well. Look forward to seeing you very soon in D.C. Um, and I hope to be able to get you back uh, very, very soon because there's a lot of stuff going on here. And any help that I can give you and any help that, you know, I don't just have Maya Culpa here. I also have Political Beatdown, which is number one in the world on YouTube during 4.30 to 5.30 Tuesdays and Thursdays with 1.7 million followers. So, you know, whatever I can do to help you, you have my you have my absolute, absolute commitment to it. I appreciate that, Michael. More power to you and please keep it up. And, you know, thank you for being an outspoken person with intricate knowledge of how the Trump administration worked and how this guy works as a politician and the work you're doing is essential. Thank, thank you, Congressman.